All right. Before we get started, we are talking today about egoism. And I did a bad job of facing things on the board, so I'll rewrite that. Uh, egoism. What do we, I mean, just, just the word. What does egoism sound like? Sounds big. Sounds big? Like a, like a jet plane big? Nominal, just. Like just conceptually sounds. large. Like complicated? It's not super complicated, uh, actually. It's pretty nice. Uh, it has the word ego in it. What does ego mean? I think any classic students in here? Anybody read any Latin? Sunday school or anything? Egoism has the word ego. Ego is Latin for I. And that's why today, right, we talk, someone has a big ego or is egotistical. They are concerned about themselves. So, I ism is basically what egoism means. The idea fundamentally boils down to concern for self. The idea that everyone is concerned or worried about himself or herself. Um, it, talk, it basically promotes the idea of being selfish, which we often think of as sort of a negative term, right? We very rarely do we say, man, I love my kid. You know, the teacher just said she's so selfish. We talked about that, right? That's not something that we hear uh, as a positive very often today. But this theory is based around the idea that selfishness is actually a positive thing. That's where, that's where we're going to end up. But we're going to start with this idea of psychological egoism versus, later, we're going to talk about ethical egoism. And the difference, the difference between these two terms, psychological and ethical egoism, is an awful lot like the difference between cultural and ethical relativism. Does anybody remember the difference between cultural relativism and ethical relativism? I know it was a week ago. It's been a long week. Many things have happened. Florida basically sank into the sea. Well, relativism is based on the idea that each culture has its own sort of set of rules, cultural norms, and so on. But the difference between cultural and relativism I'm sorry, cultural and ethical relativism is basically the difference between descriptive and prescriptive. We love those words that we've heard before. Descriptive just describes the way things are. Prescriptive talks about the way things should be. Cultural relativism talks about, well, this is just the way this is just the way cultures work. Right? Every culture has different norms and realities and so on. So cultural relativism is descriptive. It describes the way the world is. But ethical relativism is prescriptive. It talks about the way the world should be. Specifically that we ought to act, right? That that norm, that, that, norm, that cultural difference actually establishes what is good. So that people in a particular culture ought to act according to what is normal in that person's culture. Whenever we throw in the word ought or should, then we're starting to talk about prescriptive. Right? We're describing the way people should behave. Similarly, psychological egoism is descriptive. It describes the way the world works. Whether or not that's the way the world should work is a different question. But, F, but psychological egoism talks about the way the world works should work. I'm sorry, does work, does work. Ah, I just I messed myself up. Psychological egoism talks about the way the world does work. In psychological egoism, we're not saying anything about whether that's good or bad. It just is the way it is. Can you say that again? Yep, yep. So, psychological egoism is descriptive. It is describing the way the world is. It's not making any statements 
about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's simply describing the nature of the world. Right. Now, what is that nature? What is, what is the nature of the world in regard to selfishness? You guys all live in the world? Most, I assume. Some of you have never seen outside of this room, so I'm not positive of that. But, I'm going to guess that you do. What is the nature? What is, well, if you had to describe selfishness and the way that the world works in regard to it, how would you do that? What? <coughs> what? Oh, so, okay, so someone who is selfish cares for himself and his or her own well being. That's pretty good. How many people in the world are selfish? All of them, according to an egoist, according to egoism, psychological egoism says, and this is not a good thing or a bad thing, it's just a description, that everyone behaves in his or her own self-interest, for his or her own good. And you can pretend that you don't. You might come up with fun descriptions about why you did a particular thing, but at the end of the day, it's always for selfish reasons. That's what psychological egoism says, that you cannot not act selfishly, even if you want to, but you don't want to. It's not like you're fighting your inner nature to be selfish. You are. It's just the way things work. Uh, two good examples. Glaucon. Glaucon. Anybody here read The Republic? I know we've read some Plato already. We've read The Youth of Crow. Tracy read The Republic. Uh, the Republic, written by, written by our friend Plato. Plato's Republic. Uh, stars Socrates, as all of Plato's works do. And it's about the nature of the soul. And, what is justice and what makes a person a good person. And it's really long uh, compared to his other uh, dialogues. It's several books. I mean, it makes up a full book, maybe several scroll uh, long. It's, it's a real thing, the Republic. Uh, but the whole thing is really dedicated to the idea of what makes a person good. And very early in the Republic, like in the first book, there's this character named Glaucon. And he describes a magic device, a magic item. Coincidentally, weirdly, a magical ring. And guess what happens when someone finds this magical ring? What's up? They take it. Yes. And what does the magical ring do? What do all magical rings do? What? They give you wish it. No, those aren't magical rings. Those are genes. <laughs> <laughs> and or fish. Sometimes fish can be magical. We give you wishes. What do, what do magical rings do? What particular superpower? Man, rings, rings. We've all seen the movies and read the books. Hobbits? Hobbits and elves? They make you invisible. That's what magic rings always do. They make you invisible. It's true, sir. Is right? The, the, the Lord of the Rings, the whole thing, the Lord of the freaking rings, right? The ring um, is based on the idea that uh, is based on this idea from, from ancient Greece about this myth where a guy finds a ring. Right? It's actually a ring. He finds the skeleton of a giant. And on the skeleton of a giant is a ring. He takes it for himself. He's just a farmer. And he puts on the ring. He finds out and discovers that it makes him invisible. What do you think that guy does? He eavesdrops. Yes, that's one of the things he does. What else does he do? He can turn invisible. What do you think he does? Not Better, what would you do if you could turn invisible? Well, I would make people see. Check it out. How much could you spy on people? Yeah. Spy on people? What else would you do? I would walk in my what? birthday suit, take a fall. Sure, okay, you walk around naked. Well, that's, the, <laughs> that's a personal comfort. Thing. Oh, so, so I'm sorry, <laughs> taking stuff? Dude, can you take stuff? Sure, right? I mean, not me, but that's a <laughs> Glaucon's whole point is, yes, you would. Of course you would. Anyone would. Glaucon's whole point is, so this farmer takes the ring, 
becomes invisible, he starts listening in to his neighbors and to like the political his enemies and so on, so he learns all their secrets, he takes their stuff, he goes and starts sabotaging people, he eventually, right, he goes and he starts on the king, he eventually becomes king and has everything he wants, right? Because he can use his invisibility to accomplish all sorts of great things. He, nothing can stop him. And he lives happily ever after because he can turn invisible and he's awesome. Yay for him. Well, the point is, that's what anybody would do in that situation. Anyone, given the possibility, given the opportunity to turn invisible at will, would totally take advantage of it and would act to better oneself, right? Even though, even if the things that that person did were bad things, right? I mean, maybe you would go around knifing people in the dark, right? Maybe there would be a limit to how bad you would go. You could go. clip somebody. What's that? You could clip people. Sure. <laughs> sure. You could make people trip and fall down. <laughs> That, that would be, be help back And then you'd help them back. Oh, sure. Sure, yeah. So you would seemingly nice, right? That's part of Bosnian's argument, right? Is that the um, that that bad people are the ones who seem nicest, right? Because they have the power, right? If they have power, they can make themselves seem seem good. And the good people often seem like the worst because they uh, let themselves be taken advantage of, or they don't always. You know, fight tooth and claw, and so maybe they don't get that promotion, or they don't, uh, you know, go looting when the storm hits and, and mm -hmm. take the sneakers out of the, uh, out of the stores and that sort of thing, right? So they don't have the stuff and whatnot. So good people tend to be tend to suffer. Bad people tend to sort of win. And so Valkan argues, right? You would be foolish. You would be a fool. Not only would every single person take advantage of that magical ring. You would be foolish not to. Right? That, and that's just that's ridiculous. Right? That's his argument is for a psychological view that simply put, that everybody would act that way. It's just human nature. You can't not do that. That's the way people work. Another another good example comes via video clip. I love how I get to show a video clip. Hey, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. So if we're taking stuff, does that stuff become invisible too? Are you taking it? Uh, <laughs> or is it like floating in the air? <laughs> like, uh, that's a great question. You know, like in Harry Potter, so the cloak, the uh, thing, and everything. I don't know. <laughs> I don't have an invisible ring. I think, I think it's going to depend on... Uh, on the kind of ring, maybe. Uh, I don't know the mechanics. Oh no! What happened? Oh, the link's broken. That's disappointing. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see if I can figure it out. Uh, it's versus. Ha <laughs> ha! All right. So I, I don't know how many of you guys. I don't know how many of you guys watch the show Friends. Right, back in the day, uh, the the background that you kind of need to know for this is that Joey, Joey, right, is, he, he wants to be an actor, and he's not always, he doesn't always be special. What's that? Joey. Joey was the guy who just came in and talks. That's Chandler. Yes. Uh, Joey wants to be an actor, uh, and so he thinks there's no such thing as bad publicity, so he just wants to be on TV. So he volunteers to be on a telephone, uh, where he thinks that maybe he'll get a chance to be. Uh, well, he'll be on television, and, uh, and so that will help his acting career. Right? That's basically all the background you need to know for this. Um, <coughs> bump up the volume here a little bit. Vomit talks. No, no. Vomit talks. Vomit talks. Who vomited us? You know what? Aren't you up to Joe? Don't have thumbs. <laughs> All 
whatever the, that they were aiming at, their goal. And so Joey ends up on duty. Um, that wasn't really her fault. And so she ended up happy, but that wasn't why she did it. And that wasn't why she donated the money. It seems like she's actually right when she says that uh, she donated the money to, and did a nice thing that made her unhappy. So isn't that proof that, in fact, um, that she could do something that wasn't egoistic? No? Why not? So you think that that's not a realistic situation? No. Okay. Chelsea. Yeah, why? Yeah, exactly, right? That's the, you could, the whole point of the donation was to prove herself right. Right? So in that sense, and that was going to make her feel better about things. So in that sense, even even if it hadn't ended up with Joey on TV, it still would have been somewhat selfish because the whole point behind the donation was for her to end up to win the argument. Right? And so um, and in so doing, she was actually proving the opposite. She was losing the argument in her in her attempt to win the argument. Do we how do we feel about this psychological egoism idea? General. Is everybody on board with it? Yeah. Anybody not? <clears throat> Nobody? I mean, it's pretty bleak. It's a pretty bleak way of looking at the world. It's kind of bad to say that every good deed that I do, <clears throat> that if I'm trying to do them, them, that I'm, you know, even if my attempts are just to help somebody and they receive the benefit. But because I'm happy that they're good, yeah. And, um, yeah, there's a there's a there's a famous sort of story of uh, Abraham Lincoln riding in a carriage, and he passes riding with a friend of his, and he passes a, a pig on the side of the road, and the pigs little piglets are stuck in some mud, and the pig mom is you know crying out, worried about the little piglets, but can't get to them, and so Abraham Lincoln stops and pulls over. And like gets down and he helps the little pigs out, right? And his friend says, and they have been having the same conversation. The friend says, "There you go, Abe Lincoln. See, there's proof that people do things just out of the kindness of their heart sometimes." And Abraham Lincoln's whole thing is, "Oh man, I would have never gotten the gotten it out of my head. I would have been up all night worrying about that poor pig mom. I only did it so that I wouldn't have to worry about it. Right? I didn't do it because I'm a nice guy. I did it for me. At the end of the day." <clears throat> But that's still pretty bleak, right? I think we want to believe that people do nice things sometimes, and, and not because they get something out of it. I think, I think I do. You think you do? OK. Like what? Um, I don't know. I, I'm just a different person, even though I don't want to. Or I may not like my cousin wanted to get up and go to work, but her cab was late. So I didn't really want to get up and bring right. her to work, but... But you did? I did. Why? Because she needed a ride. <laughs> really? Because... Was that the only reason? I mean... Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> it had nothing to do with, I don't know, your cousin paying her share of the rent and... Uh, I, you know, yeah. uh, or making her angry or anything like that. No, I was kind of already upset because she woke me up anyway. <laughs> But often, right, often we do things like that, what we call favors, not because we are being totally generous with our time and money, but because we uh, just don't want that person to be upset with us, right? Like if we just say no, right, then we either have to come up with a good reason or right, or we or have to deal with the fact that like we're just going like, oh, I just don't feel like it, right? How many times have you ever said that to someone? Mm -hmm. like, when they say like, hey, can you do this thing for me, how many times in your life have you responded with, I don't want to? Not I want myself to do that. <laughs> As you get older, it's easier. No, I think it's fair. But I mean, it's, it's a hard thing to do, even if you can do it, right? It's not something that is easy to do. It's certainly not something that people do very often. Um, more often than not, we come up with reasons to avoid conflict and you know, come up with like, oh man, I'd really like to. 
but you know, I'm having my spleen removed that day, and I just can't make it. You know, there's always some. I can't just say like, no, I just, you know, I just don't like you that much. You know, or, or you know, I value our, our the fact that you're my mom, but honestly, you know, you kind of are annoying, and so I don't want to come to Thanksgiving. Uh, that that just doesn't happen. Right? And so we we often do things to avoid conflict, we do to make our lives easier. Right? Because if I don't go to Thanksgiving, then my mom's going to be upset, and she's going to call all the time, and she won't send my daughter a Christmas present, and blah, 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 right? All these things make my life better, so that's why I do. Right? Maybe. Maybe. And if I want to go to Thanksgiving, right? Say I'm not the kind of person who argues with my mom, so like, sweet, I want to go. Well, then obviously I'm going to Thanksgiving because I want to, right? Because it's what I want, right? So that's even also. Egoistic, right? Either way you look at it, it's what I want. I do what I want, what I think is best for me. Yeah. Even what's best for me is to accept the fact that you are going because you want me to go. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> making you happy means making me less unhappy. Sure, sure, yeah, 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 right. Sometimes, sometimes you're stuck between two bad choices, right? And so you choose the one that is least miserable, right? That's still still acting in your own self-interest, right? Um, thoughts, questions. I'm still surprised that everybody is so comfortable with this. Chris is not. She's not buying it. I don't think I actually would. I wouldn't have been comfortable with it before now. Before I explain. Okay. I definitely would. Well, good. I wouldn't want you to be comfortable with something you didn't really know anything about. That's, that's not a good place to be. Uh, what about things that we do that are straight up bad for us? Smoking. Nobody in here, I hope, at this on October, September, September 13th, 2017, still believes that smoking is like good for you. But people still smoke. It's baffling. I see, every time I see somebody smoking. Yeah, particularly if they're young. Like, I get it. Like, old people have a hard time getting rid of habits or whatever. Maybe they've been smoking for a long time and it's hard to quit, whatever. But, like, young people who just started smoking, like, in the last maybe five or ten years, and if anybody in here falls into that category, shame on you. <laughs> I'm not taking that, I'm not in any way retracting my shock at you. But, like, how does that happen? How do we how do we justify that? If everything we do is what is good for us, then how do we justify smoking? Because it's pleasurable. Ah. Yeah. So right. even though it's not actually good for you, it's good for them at that moment. It feels good to them. Yeah, yeah, that's often often the case, right? I know that long term this is not good for me, but it makes me feel so good right now that I'm going to do it. Well, um, some people see it as other things are bad for you too, so why, why not smoke? Just do it. Uh, yeah, sure. I, yeah, I don't know that that's exactly how people put it, right? Some that's people. like saying, you know, like, I might as well shoot myself because knives hurt too. You know, right? that's, I don't think that's, I don't think that's <laughs> what they mean, right? Well, I hear people saying, well, the air we breathe ain't good either, so what's the difference? Well, that's just bad. <laughs> that's just silly, right? Well, it's really just their way of saying, I like what I'm doing, I'm doing yeah. Yeah. That's what they mean. I, I, I like this, it feels good, it makes me feel good, I'm going to do it, and I can, because I'm a grown up and I'm used to it, right? Um, so, again, right, even things that are patently bad for us, in right, the idea of, of egoism, still can be justified through egoism. This idea that we do, we always make decisions based on what we want. Now, some people will, some people will argue there's a slight difference between rash. Well, never mind. I'll get to that when I talk about that. I don't know how bad. Don't want to skip ahead. Other question. Um, it's a popular theory. It's a popular theory for reasons that I have listed here. A lot of people like this idea of egoism, um, partly because it feels honest, right? None of this, we're not, not 
fooling around with, oh, some people are nice because they're just saints or they're raised better or whatever, right? No, nobody's really nice. It makes us feel good, right? We get to take the halos off of the people, and we all get to feel a little better about ourselves, right? Yeah, I didn't go to my mom's for Thanksgiving. That's okay, right? Because everybody does stuff like that, right? Everybody acts the way that they want to, and so, sure, I'm not a saint, but that's okay. Nobody really is. Even the saints aren't really saints, right? They're just doing what they do because it makes them feel good, because they like that, like that right? We, we like that idea. And we like, right, there's a little bit of cynicism. There's, we've grown as a culture a little bit more cynical. Right? Anybody, everything is, is too good to be true. Right? Anybody who's actually good, that can't, they can't really be that good. Right? We want to scrape away the, the you know, the, the kindness. Oh, Mother Teresa, sure, she was, she was lovely. Everybody says Mother Teresa is lovely. Well, except for the fact that she was just horrible in some ways. Right? We, we're so excited when we find out some of that stuff. Right? And, and she was. She was. She had some uh, hidden bits, right? Sure. Dalai Lama has a collection of extremely expensive cars. This is like the chief Buddhist guy who's supposed to be all like, you know, education, money doesn't mean anything, except for my really expensive cars that I love. Right? We love to find out stuff like that. It makes us feel good about ourselves and about right, the nature of the world. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. I'm going to die anyway. I might as well smoke my cigarettes, right? That, that's one of the reasons that a, that a theory like this is so popular. Um, and it allows us to make excuses. Right? It's not my fault that I do this. It's, it's just human nature. <clears throat> right? And it's just the way people are. I can't help it. Right? I'd like to be nicer, but <laughs> what are you going to do? You know? um, it's, there are a lot of people who like theories like this. Right? Yeah, of course if I had, right, what do you expect Donald Trump to do? Right? Of course he's colluding with Russia. He can't. I would too if I were in that spot. Right? That's what people say. I'm not saying I would. I'm not suggesting that, that Donald Trump should collude with Russia, but we can see why people would would embrace that, right? He can get you do it, he can get away with it, of course he should. Right? He'd be foolish not to. He has the magical invisible ring. Right? He would be foolish not to take advantage of all of the sort of power and authority that he has. Yes? Problems. Problems with, uh, with the theory. Because every theory has problems, right? That's the whole point of them being called theories. Um, a good theory of any sort can be falsified, at least theoretically. That doesn't mean that every theory is wrong in some way. It just means that in order for a theory to be a good theory, you've got to at least be able to conceive of the possibility that it's false. Right? The theory of evolution, Darwin's theory of evolution, um, does not say there's no way any other possibility is true. Evolution is the way. Right? The theory of evolution says, well, this is the best model we've come up with so far that fits all of the data, so we're going to go with it. But if someone comes up with a different, like if someone can prove something that falsifies evolution, we'll go with that. That's awesome. Right? That's the whole point of a good scientific theory. Theory of egoism can't even accept the possibility that it's wrong, because no matter what you say, no matter what you say, someone's going to, I can come back with, well, yeah, sure, but that's just because you want to feel or you want to write, you, you do something, right? I can come back with every single possible argument you have against egoism and say, well, really, that made you feel good, right? Marissa's driving her cousin to work today. If we if we knew all the details, and I'm not going to interrogate her to get all the details, I'm positive I can come up with a way that I could point to that. Well, that really was just making you happy at the end of the day, for some reason. Was that? Some way, some reason. Right. I got up really early this morning to walk the dog. I did not want to get up really early this morning to walk the dog. But I did it because it improves my relationship with my wife. Right. Right. Um, there, there, there's always some place, something you can go back to with egoism. Because ultimately, right, it's really easy to tie like emotional states and stuff to egoism. Right? You know, oh, it made you, 
made you at least not unhappy, right? It's really easy to get there. And any theory that just can't even, I mean, it's basically begging the question. Do we know what begging the question is? Oh, begging the question. This, this phrase is like the bane of my existence. Ah, oh, I hate it. Because you've all heard somebody say, it begs the question. Not what it means. We're about to learn. You're all about to learn a really important thing about English. I don't know why I have this marker in my hand, but I'm not going to write anything down. <laughs> <laughs> Begging the question. You've heard it used in the following way. Uh, Billy was late for school today, which begs the question what happened to the bus? Right? That's how you've heard that phrase used, right? Something happened, which makes me wonder about something else. And so people, maybe about Billy or something, right? Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder some question. Like, uh, it's raining today, which begs the question, what's up with that meteorologist? He said it was going to be sunny, right? That's how people use the phrase, it begs the question. Totally not what it means. What people mean to say is, that makes me wonder. Or, I now have a question, right? That's those are, those are totally different things from begging the question. Begging the question is a philosophical term. It's a technical term. It means to assume the answer in the statement, to assume the proof in the statement. Like if I say, mom's never wrong because mom's always right. Begging the question. That's an assumption, right? You're assuming the answer in the proof for the answer. Right? That's, you can't do that. That's obviously a fallacy. Right? It's a logical fallacy. You can't just assume, right? Like, why is 2 plus 3 5? Because it is, right? That's begging the question. That is not a proof of anything. Yes? That's what begging the question actually means. So the next time you hear somebody say, which begs the question, smack them. Because they're wrong. And do it because it'll make me happy. <laughs> it's a it's strange version of it. Yeah. Um, which might get you a better grade, right? And therefore, it's better for you. Ah, uh, that's, I'm, 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 gonna get, I'm not going to give anybody an A for smacking it. B minus is as high as I go. <laughs> um, anywho, the whole idea of this, this inability to falsify is basically tied into begging the question. What people are saying is, ethical egoism is always right, or is true, because ethical egoism is true. Right? They're just stating the proof as the statement. Right? Here, let me show you it's true, because what you did when you drove your cousin to the work, that was for your benefit. I'm basically proving that it was for your benefit by saying it was for your benefit. And I'm just doing this little circular argument. It doesn't actually prove anything. Right? Now, that doesn't mean it's wrong. But that's a problem with the theory. That's a, it's, it's hard to defend the theory when you can't actually prove it logically. And your proof boils down to a lot of fallacy. Breaking the rules in a lot of the argument. So, falsification is not possible, which doesn't mean that he was wrong. It just makes it harder to defend. Secondly, is doing what we want always selfish? No. No. Not always. Abraham Lincoln, right? Saving the pigs. It was what he wanted to do so that he wouldn't. You know, stay up at night thinking about that poor piggy mom. But was it selfish? Really? It's not really. Maybe, maybe not. But but either way, right? He he did something, right? We call like, by our definition of selfish, what he did was not selfish. <clears throat> sure, it benefited him. That doesn't mean it was necessarily selfish. Right? He could have. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, something can be both for your benefit and nice at the same time. Driving your cousin to work may have done something for you, whatever that might have been, but also was a nice thing. Right? So that doesn't necessarily mean that the things that we want to do are, in fact, selfish. And so, right, there's some, that we should, again, gives us a little bit of wiggle room. Right? That's not saying that we, ah, no, well, we don't. can I say it in time? Yes. Uh, not suggesting that we, right, this still agrees that we all do what we want to do all the time. Just saying that that might be okay. Not 
is literally its own thing. And finally, there's this, uh, this great phrase. If you ever want to sound really smart in front of somebody, right, bust out with, oh, well, you're just talking about the fallacy of the suppressed relative. Right? And then somebody, that, you know, whoever you're talking to will say, I'm going to get a drink. Um, <laughs> Fallacy of the suppressed correlative. A correlative is a equal and opposite, generally. Right? Hot and cold, correlatives. Light and dark, correlatives. Good and bad, correlatives. Those are, each one of those is a pair of correlatives. When we suppress a correlative, well, when we talk about a correlative, we can only define one in terms of the other. Right? Dark is defined as the absence of light. If you've never seen light, you can't understand what darkness is. Right? Heat or cold is the absence of heat. If there is no heat, there is no cold. Good is the opposite of bad. If nothing, if everything's good, then the word good, then, then bad has no meaning. Right? We need one for the other. So when we suppress one, we're actually destroying the definition of the other. Right. So, right, then you've heard, like, how do we, we have darkness so that we can learn to appreciate the light, right, that sort of phrase that we've heard before. We have to have, right, if you don't have darkness, everything's light, then there is no light, there, it doesn't mean anything, because it just is what it is, and there's nothing to compare it to, right. The, a, a, maybe a more sort of basic example is, right, you're, you're studying for a test, you've got your book, your notes out, you've got your highlighter, highlighting things, and you're highlighting the important stuff, but man, there's lots of important stuff, and you keep highlighting and highlighting, and eventually you look back at the page, you realize you highlighted everything. And if you highlighted everything, nothing is highlighted, right? It's just a page again. So the idea is you take out the stuff. It's like, uh, you know, if somebody curses all the time, they're always using potty language, right? But then something really bad happens, they don't have any word to express that they're really upset, because they already used all of their Right? Like, oh, yeah, that guy dropped the F-bomb again. He probably just, you know, dropped his quarter, because that's what he does. And so you don't have that. It's, it's a little bit of the boy cry wolf syndrome, right? If you're, if you're crying wolf all the time, then when there's actual trouble, you don't have anything. You've lost the power of those words. If everything is selfish, then what is unselfish? Nothing. Take the word unselfish out of our lexicon because nothing is unselfish. What does it mean to be selfish? It doesn't mean anything. It just is what it is. Right? We've destroyed the word selfish if we say that there is no such thing as unselfish. Does that make sense? A little bit? And some people will argue, well, you know, there's more selfish and less selfish. Right? Some things are like the pig thing with Abraham Lincoln, that was less selfish, as opposed to, like, I'm just going to go beat up that guy and take his lunch money. That's more selfish. Right? But really, now you're just redefining the word selfish and unselfish. Right? That's, you're just shifting the selfishness gauge up. So that now the big Abraham Lincoln pig thing is unselfish, and the taking lunch money is selfish. But if you're going to say that that's selfish, too, we, we've lost the word unselfish. It doesn't exist. And if that doesn't exist, neither does the word selfish. That is the fallacy of the suppressed correlative. Right? We need the opposite to define a thing. If we don't have the opposite, then it doesn't exist. That's all super complicated and not always very compelling. <laughs> if somebody were to come up to you and say, yeah, I believe that everybody is just out looking out for their own well-being, I don't know that you would be able to say, well, what about the fallacy of the suppressed correlative? Right? And have them go, oh, you're right. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I take it back. Right? I don't think that's going to convince a whole lot of people. But right, these are all the sorts of things, right? All three of these things put together are the sorts of things that <clears throat> lead people to think that there might it might be more complicated than egoism is leading us to believe. I mean, egoism seems very simple, but in actuality, it might be more complicated. Than that. <sighs> okay, I've just done a lot of talking about the thing that I don't even want to talk about today. Um, I do want to talk about egoism, but I want to talk about ethical egoism, because that's more important for our, for our discussion today. But we have to kind of get through the psychological egoism to get there. How are we doing on time? Oh my god. All right. Um, so we just about half the class on about half the stuff. Uh, ethical egoism. So if, if psychological egoism is 
descriptive, what do we think ethical egoism is? Prescriptive, good, right? There's more correlative. Prescriptive. I don't know the fact that we're not a good example of correlative. <laughs> um, again, what does prescriptive mean? It tells us how things ought to be. Right? It tells us how things ought to be. This is a guide to right behavior, according to an egoist. Right? An ethical egoist is going to say, not only do all people act selfishly, but all people should act selfishly. All people ought to act selfishly. If you want to know the right act, the right behavior, the right thing to do in a given situation, act selfishly. And you'll be on our path. And again, this strikes us as generally, I don't know, how many people, right? How does that make us feel? Just that first blush, the idea that it is right to behave selfishly. No, not a fan. This is definitely not a fan. No. The, right, and it doesn't seem right, right? Because we've been taught selfishness, not a virtue, right? You're supposed to share, even in your kindergarten. Right? That's the one thing you get in trouble for in kindergarten. Like the one thing you get in trouble for in kindergarten. Ah, little Tommy didn't share his books. Right? Everything that you can do, you can literally pee on the floor and they'll be like, well, you know, it's fine. Right? But if you don't share your truck, they will call your mom and they will get on you for that. It's the one way to mess up. So selfish is not okay. Right? At least that's what we've been taught. But an egoist is going to say, ah, that's, that's silly. Um, because not only because we do act selfishly, even if we don't want to, right? But <clears throat> ethical egoist is also a psychological egoist. He's going to say, well, we do all act selfishly. And furthermore, that that's the way it ought to be. The ethical egoist changes the golden rule. We're all familiar with the golden rule. So you don't know the golden rule. Who knows the golden rule? Christina, what's the golden rule? You don't know. Yeah, the golden rule, what is it? What? I don't remember right now. No, the golden rule, what's the golden rule? Yeah, classic, right? The do unto others. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The golden rule. The golden rule. Not really the best golden rule in the history of golden rules, honestly. Right? Right? Have we? There's a new version, actually. Like schools are teaching these days. Have we heard the new version? It's not not this one. Yeah. A slightly different new version. Treat others as they want to be treated. Right? Don't treat others the way that you want to be treated. <coughs> maybe you're a weirdo and you like being hit with sticks. Right? <laughs> or uh, or who knows what? Right? But rather. You should treat other people as they would like to be treated. All right? So if Matt likes to be hit with sticks, I'll hit him with sticks. Maybe he does that well. That seems reasonable, right? That's a pretty good golden rule. Treat people the way they want to be treated. The egoist says, actually, there's a different golden rule, which goes like this. <clears throat> if I mistreat others, they will mistreat me. And so, I don't mistreat others. It's totally selfish. It's totally selfish. Right? The golden rule that you've grown up with is the idea that you're nice to people because you're just supposed to be. Right? This golden rule says <coughs> I'm nice to people. Why? So they'll be nice to me. Right? That's the whole point. But isn't it just like the first one? Yeah, because what if you're a weirdo and you like to be mistreated, so you do mistreat others? Uh, uh, it's the same thing, isn't it? Well, no, because the theory is, let's say I'm a weirdo and I like to be beaten with sticks. Mm -hmm. If I am mean to you, Crystal, then you won't beat me with sticks. Right? It doesn't say, I'm going to treat you like A so that you'll treat me like A. It's, I'm going to treat you in a nice way so that you'll treat me in a nice way. This one. Yes. And my nice way is to hit me with sticks. Does that make a little bit of sense? So maybe not doing a good job of explaining. Um, 
it's not a mural, right? It's not intended to be like, I give Patrick five dollars, so Patrick will give me five. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying it, it doesn't have to be the same treatment. That's right. That's right. Just with both with positive outcomes. Basically, if I do something you don't like, whatever that may be, uh -huh. you'll do something I don't like, whatever that may be. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. So in order to keep you from doing things that I don't like, no matter what it is, I'm going to not do things that you don't like. Oh, uh, versus the other one, treat others how you want to be treated. Because you might not want to be treated like me. Right. Okay. I think right. I got it. <laughs> yes. Even if, right, even if we go with the better version of the golden rule, right, treat others as they want to be treated, that's still, the goal there is the other person's well-being. Right? That's sort of the target of that golden rule. Whereas this, the goal here is totally my well-being. I'm only behaving well so that other people will behave well for me. This is, um, this is essentially, if you've done any sort of political philosophy, this is essentially the whole idea behind a social contract theory. Um, if you've read any Hobbes or anything like that, you may have seen this in like a poli-sci class and taken any of those. The social contract theory, the whole idea is, I'm gonna give up some of my rights so that you give up some of your rights. And then not, like my right to say, hit anybody I see with a brick. Right? I'm gonna give up that right so that you also give up your right to hit anybody you see with a brick. And now we all live comfortably together and nobody has to worry about being hit by a brick. Right? So we, we, everybody's giving up some of their rights so that we can all live together peacefully. Right? So I'm not going to hit you with a brick so that you don't hit me with a brick. Right? I mean, and again, that's, to be clear, that's, it's not, it doesn't have to be a mirror like that, but it's that same idea. Right? We agree that culture works better if we treat each other well, it's in my best interest to treat you guys well so that I don't have to worry about you coming up to me with pitchforks and, and torches, right? That's essentially the whole idea behind egoism. I am only nice to other people because in the long run, it benefits me. I only drive my cousin to work because in the long run, it benefits me. And that's how it should be, according to an ego. That's not like a coincidence. It didn't just work out that way. We're designed that way. That's how humans are built to determine right and wrong. Right? Like, should I steal the hundred dollars that's sitting on the desk? The egoist says, No. No. Why not? No, you steal my. Karma's gonna get you. Okay. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Right. Karma might get me. Who else might get me? Someone else. Someone else, like, sure, the person might catch me. And then what would happen? The police will get me, right? I don't steal because I'm worried about punishments, right? In many ways, <coughs> this is religion, right? I don't do bad things to people so that I don't go to hell, right? This is a long-term what's best for me strategy. I would much rather go to the place where it's harps and clouds and, and, and so on, and happiness all day, than the alternative. So I do good. Not because it's good, but because I don't want to be punished. Right? Now, right, and, and, and that seems like a weird thing to say, like, oh, wait, whoa, 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 no, no, <coughs> commandments are, no, we're good people, we people who follow those ten commandments. But in reality, a lot of the time, people defend those with this sort of self-concern. Mm -hmm. They usually do this, so you won't get that. Yeah, yeah, totally. totally. Instead of, you should do this because it's the right thing to do. Exactly. Every right. single time any parent has told a kid, don't do that, or they are they are playing off of this idea. Oh, wow. Right? All right? You'll get a time out, you'll get spanked, whatever. The whole idea is don't do that bad thing because it's in your best interest not to. Not because it's wrong. So how do we assume that our children is going to recognize that, oh, so it becomes wrong well, because of the punishment? Well, right, oh, so, it's not. yeah, it's, a, it's more complicated than that, right? Because we're hoping that they'll figure it out, right? 
<laughs> if we're doing it right. If we're doing it right, I'll figure it out. Tell me. Yeah. Don't use the pro me. Yeah. <laughs> 